Thank you, Dr. Wong. Uh, so I'm Colin Kennedy. I'm one of the fourth year residents um, here in the Department of Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Um, as you see, our topic today is uh, flexor tenosynovitis, um, infection of the finger. Um, I'm going to start with just a little bit of an outline. I'll be starting with um, some historical background. I'm going to discuss some of the diagnostic challenges with this diagnosis, um, as well as a brief overview of the different treatment strategies. Uh, Dr. Stephen Kennedy is then going to discuss um, the utility of the Knabel signs, uh, how this relates to systems-based practice, as well as um, other clinical prediction tools used for other infections and how those um, relate somewhat to how we uh, diagnose flexor tenosynovitis. Dr. Pottinger is then going to talk to us about uh, some of the microbiology as well as role for infectious disease consultations and antibiotic therapy uh, in these infections. Flexor tenosynovitis represents uh, almost 10% of hand infections in some series. Uh, there's high morbidity as well as potential loss of digit with delayed or misdiagnosis. And uh, differentiation from other infections is essential uh, both for safe and cost-effective uh, hospital transfer decisions. Uh, but this diagnosis in this uh, can be made difficult by similar presentations of pain, redness, and functional limitation of other diagnoses, such as cellulitis and abscesses. Just to start with a brief anatomy overview of the flexor tendon, um, the flexor tendons are composed of both retinacular and synovial tissue, and they form a closed anatomic space. The distal end of the flexor tendon terminates near the bony insertion of the FDP tendon, uh, or the, at the bony insertion of the FPL tendon in the thumb, and the proximal extents of the sheaths of the index, middle, and ring finger lie just proximal to the A1 pulleys. Um, this horseshoe that you see up here, I'm not a, a Colts fan, but this is just to bring up the horseshoe abscesses that uh, we hear about frequently that um, can develop when a small finger flexor tendon infection tracks through the radial and ulnar bursae and then develops into a thumb infection as well, forming a horseshoe abscess. And the reason that this can happen uh, are that in approximately 20 percent, excuse me, 80% of patients, those radial and ulnar bursae are continuous uh, and thus give the potential for a horseshoe abscess to develop. Dr. Matson and his seminal work on compartment syndrome I uh, explained that although compartmental syndromes are usually discussed in relation to fascial compartments of the extremities, increased pressure within any closed space may be similarly detrimental. And there is a, one belief behind uh, flexor tenosynovitis is that this represents a possible compartment syndrome of the finger itself. This is a study from USC where they actually uh, took a striker type device to measure compartment pressures and actually measured the digit pressures in fingers with confirmed flexor tenosynovitis and compared it to a contralateral control digit and actually found elevated pressures in all of the, uh, all of the digits compared to its control. Um, further illustrating this uh, compartment syndrome theory of flexor tenosynovitis, this is a case of a 42-year-old male who um, cut his finger playing a guitar string and then came into an emergency room four days later with all four uh, canaval signs present. He went to the operating room for an irrigation and debridement where both of his digital arteries were actually found to be thrombosed and ended up developing a distal necrosis of that fingertip. So the authors of this uh, paper actually postulated that the increased tissue pressure and reduced e venous outflow may have uh, actually led to a compartment syndrome type of picture in this flexor tendon infection. Although hematogenous spread is described, uh, most of these infections result from a penetrating injury such as a sharp object, uh, an IV drug use needle, or even an animal bite or human bite. Dr. Alan Knavel uh, founded and was named the chairman of Northwestern, their uh, Department of Neurosurgery, uh, in the 1920. And his seminal work on hand infections um, described what we commonly know now as the Knavel signs, which are the four physical exam findings that we frequently use to diagnose these infections. Uh, in his original work in 1912, he described exquisite tenderness over the course of the sheath flexion posture of the finger and exquisite pain on extending the finger. And then uh, later, not published until 1939, the whole uh, of the f involved finger is uniformly swollen, was then added. And these came together to form what are now commonly known as those four canaval signs that uh, we all know are used as our main physical exam tool to diagnose these infections. And again, these are fusiform swelling of the digit, flex posturing, tenors to palpation along the volar sheath, uh, and pain with uh, passive extension of the digit. These are just some images highlighting uh, some of these findings, these four canaval signs. This is actually a pediatric patient um, showing uh, the four canaval signs present. 
The differential diagnosis of these finger infections is uh, broad. It can be broad and can be a difficult diagnosis. Cellulitis, abscess, uh, herpetic whitlow, which is actually pictured here, osteomyelitis, septic arthritis, crystal-induced arthritis, and calcific tendonitis can all have similar presentations uh, of flexor tendon infections. And the challenge is that uh, these four physical exam tools that we use are the primary clinical tool to diagnose um, flexor tendon infection, but they have not been validated, and to date nothing has really ever been shown to be any better. Uh, in addition, labs and imaging are relatively nonspecific, and we still don't really know if one canaval sign is more sensitive or specific than the other signs. Uh, in addition, there's some subjectivity with the canaval signs. What exactly is fusiform swelling? Is there a size cutoff? Um, and what really defines volar tenderness to palpation along the flexor sheath? Um, if you have dorsal tenderness with volar tenderness, does that still count as having a volar tenderness and that canaval sign uh, present? So there's some subjectivity in these that um, hasn't really been hashed out in the literature as to um, it, the true definitions of what each sign is. Just to illustrate that this can be a difficult diagnosis, I have a couple cases to quickly present. Um, this, if you can imagine, if it's from an emergency department provider, you know, who's three hours away at a different hospital. There appears to be an area of fluctuance on the dorsal finger, but the whole finger is quite swollen. The patient is holding the digit flexed. He has a lot of pain when I extend the digit or palpate anywhere on the finger. Should I be worried about flexor tenus synovitis? And I think you can imagine, especially without seeing the digit and getting to examine it yourself, uh, these kind of conversations, especially when it involves a potential hospital transfer, uh, can be quite difficult. Just from hearing that on the phone, this could represent this, which is you know, a potentially small dorsal abscess or paronychia. That could represent this, which is a dorsal hand cellulitis. Or again, it could represent a full-blown uh, flexor ten uh, tenosynovitis appearance. Uh, second case, this actually was a case that we had uh, at Harborview this summer. 69-year-old male had came into the emergency department with three days of severe middle finger pain, no recent history of penetrating trauma, he actually had some drainage from the volar middle phalanx region that was sent for gram stain and came back um, as calcium pyrophosphate dehydrate crystals. His CRP was extremely elevated at 101. He did have a history of gout, but he had all four canaval signs on, on physical exam. So initially, you know, it could be tempting to dismiss this as a, you know, a gout flare. He even had an x-ray shown here that showed um, calcific deposits in his uh, flexor tendon region. And it would be quite difficult to say, you know, this is likely a gout flare and we don't have to do anything surgically about this. But he went to the operating room uh, where tophaceous material was actually found uh, in the volar finger. And the flexor tendon was opened up and the culture was, uh, cultures were sent from the fluid. Uh, and the cultures actually came back polymicrobial with beta hemolytic strep as well as coagulase negative staph. Um, and again, this highlights the importance of being vigilant with these diagnoses and also highlights that the uh, diagnosis is not always straightforward and can have a mixed picture, especially when there's other uh, comorbidities. In terms of the treatment options, uh, IV antibiotics almost always play some role in these infections. There's also a described role for IV antibiotics alone and um, without surgery if these are caught very early. But in general, this is considered a surgical uh, diagnosis. Now, the three main surgical options are open irrigation and debridement, which is considered the gold standard for, um, for ex extensive infections and then closed tendon sheath irrigation and continuous closed irrigation um, I'll quickly discuss as well. Uh, open irrigation and debridement, some incisions are pictured here uh, with the Brunner type incisions. Um, closed tendon sheath irrigation was actually described in the 1970s. Um, it's an option that allows one to create a proximal incision near the A1 pulley. Um, you can then thread an angiocatheter distally into the sheath and that exits in a distal mid-axial incision uh, near the level of the DIP joint and you can, you can use an angiocatheter, you can thread a latex-free Penrose drain or other device um, through, the, uh, through the sheath, and then drainage can actually be commenced through the flexor tendon sheath without the full comorbidity of making open um, incisions like were pictured before. This is a study uh, from 2002 that actually compared that closed catheter irrigation uh, with open irrigation and uh, debridement. They found no difference uh, in terms of resolution of infection, postoperative outcomes, length of hospital stay, or need for return to the operating room. And then the, the last option is continuous closed irrigation, which is where a catheter is placed um, so that irrigation can be commenced, but then this is actually left in place, and this is done on the, on the floor. Um, critics of this site, uh, it's difficult uh, to keep the catheter in place in excessive nursing demands. We don't actually employ this method um, at Harborview currently. So with that, uh, 
turn it over to Dr. Kennedy. Good morning. Thank you, Colin. Um, Colin should be congratulated. He's done a lot of work uh, for this topic, not just for the Grand Rounds presentations today, but for his classifications and brief article in uh, CORE, and also, as Dr. Huang mentioned, his work on the study that, we'll, that he'll be presenting is one of the top, pi top five papers at the Residents and Fellows meeting at the end of this month. As I prepared for this presentation, it made me uh, remember my fourth year of residency. And it was around this time, September of my fourth year, that I was uh, doing a visiting research rotation with David Ring at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. And uh, I was invited to Journal Club over at Jesse Jupiter's house. And I was you know, really excited about it because everything he's done in orthopedic trauma and in hand surgery. Uh, but one comment that really stuck with me was that after we reviewed the journal articles, he uh, turned to us and said, I'm sick of you young guys doing studies about things we already know. <laughs> and uh, what he was trying to say was that, um, you know, in many cases, the, the, he was talking about new randomized controlled trials and systematic reviews um, on topics where he felt that these questions had already been, been answered with a lower level of ev evidence. And so I wondered what Dr. Jupiter would think about us studying a topic like the diagnosis of pyogenic flexor tenus synovitis, uh, which Alan B. Cannibal uh, published over 100 years ago. With keen observation and good writing, he was able to tell us that if someone has flexor tenus synovitis, their finger is going to be diffusely swollen. It's going to sit in a semi-flex position. When you pa passively extend it, it's going to hurt a lot. And when you <coughs> palpate on the tendon sheath, it's going to be very painful. Because of his work, uh, the attending hand surgeons in this room, the uh, fellows and the residents can pretty reliably, we talked about a couple of exceptions, but can pretty reliably diagnose a flexor tenus synovitis with uh, just a little bit of uh, experience and because of his work. Our problem, however, is a little bit less about evaluation uh, of patients and, uh, by hand surgeons in our own center, but um, across the U.S. and Canada and the, and the world more uh, globally. Um, within the Wyoming region, we have 25% of the surface area of the U.S., but only 5% of the uh, population. We want to ensure that patients who have pyogenic flexor tenus synovitis get qu treated quickly. This is a surgical urgency, and they need to have their tendon sheath drained and irrigated by someone who is familiar with the anatomy as soon as possible. But people who have an ab uh, a minor abscess or a cellulitis, we want those people to be treated cost-effectively and in a timely manner closer to home to save uh, uh, excessive costs. What uh, complicates the issue is that multiple studies have concluded that many transfers also occur for non-medical reasons. Transfers are affected by the time of day, the day of the week, insurance status of the patient, how call is covered at the hospital and by what service, and the familiarity of the primary provider and the specialist with the diagnosis. In many centers, hand surgeons will provide clinic follow-up from the ER, but they won't actually provide direct ER coverage uh, to the emergency room. Or the specialist who's covering the ER may have a subspecialty interest that uh, doesn't involve the hand very often, so they may feel a little bit unfamiliar. Sometimes we can have a preconceived notion that maybe more transfers occur on evenings or weekends when people can't be bothered to come into the ER. But in actual fact, most of these transfers happen during the middle of the day on weekdays, possibly when surgeons are uh, otherwise busy seeing uh, busy clinics or in the operating room. Whatever the reason, there's uh, multiple reasons that kind of cloud the issue. And if we could uh, have more clarity in terms of the diagnosis for the emergency provider to understand whether something is a flexor tenus synovitis or not, it would go a long way. A tremendous number of patients who do get transferred end up coming to our ER at Harborview and get, uh, discharged, and get discharged from the ER without further 
care without admission or having to have a surgery. Uh, in many studies, it's, uh, the range is between 15 to 40 percent of people will be discharged with emergency uh, room uh, care only after being transferred. So it's not likely that we can change access to hand surgeons or expand the experience of referring centers. So we need to be creative. And um, you know, within our own uh, gr uh, group, looking at that kind of creativity, Neil Terabagkar and one of our recent graduates, Kenny Gundel, um, Matt Iorio, and um, attending uh, Dr. Uh, Jeff Friedrich, just in December published a, a study about uh, evaluation of dysvascular digits. And simply by putting an oxygen saturation probe and reading the number and evaluating it with uh, statistical methods, they were able to come up with a pretty good prediction of whether someone who has a dysvascular digit is going to need urgent revascularization or whether it can wait. And I think we need to be looking for those kinds of uh, tools that are ubiquitously available and easily performed by someone in the emergency department to um, uh, better evaluate these patients. In our case, we set out to evaluate the Cannabell cardinal signs, and, uh, but also evaluate the use of clinical prediction rules or tools, which have been used in other areas to predict the presence and or severity of a clinical condition. So the Ottawa ankle rules, for example, have been used to decide whether someone should have an ankle x-ray in the ER. Uh, the Lyrinix score is used to estimate the risk of someone having a necrotizing soft tissue infection. Um, the online FRAX tool has been used to estimate uh, future fragility fracture risk and osteoporosis. We were most interested, however, in the uh, COCR criteria for uh, septic, arth septic arthritis of the hip in children. Untreated septic hip uh, in a young child can have disastrous consequences, but children can present similarly with transient synovitis of the hip, which has a benign course. So COCR used existing evidence, things that had already been evaluated in other studies, to support or review, uh, refute the diagnosis of septic hip in a child, and then studied it in a systematic way to develop a tool that uh, can be used to estimate risk. And uh, came up with a uh, four item tool. These are equally weighted and can be uh, used uh, fairly easily. And uh, it basically involved whether, whether the patient's non-weight bearing, their temperature being greater than 38.5, ESR greater than 40, or a white blood cell count greater than 12. And if there's only one of those factors, the chances of that, per, of that child having a septic hip is about 3%. But if they have all four, it's 99%. And um, you know, two, it's 40%, and three is 93%. So that can be a very helpful tool when you're trying to make a big decision about whether someone's going to have to go to the OR or not. We set out to evaluate whether a similar tool could be created for cannabis signs and other measures of infection that are readily available and performed in the emergency department already. We also were interested in what is the sensitivity and specificity and of the cannabis signs and what's their positive predictive value. We were really surprised to find out that this had not really been uh, evaluated before. Are they equally weighted and are they independent of each other? So uh, we started by scanning the literature. We did a, a systematic uh, review of the literature to find anything related to cannabis signs. Uh, diagnosis of pyogenic flexor tenosynovitis and anything we could, that could conceivably help us uh, diagnose uh, PFT or distinguish it from a cellulitis or another hand infection. So we found uh, cannabis signs, whether or not there's a puncture wound or a bite, um, laboratory examination, fever, pain, and uh, duration of symptoms. We then uh, obtained IRB approval and gathered a res retrospective sample over a five-year period within our institution for anybody that was evaluated for this possible diagnosis um, by people in our, depart our orthopedic department. We then compared the two populations of patients, the patients who had the confirmed diagnosis of PFT versus the patients who did not have PFT but had like cellulitis or a small, hand, uh, small abscess. And uh, for example, if we look at the comparisons, you know, age, 44 years of age for someone who, for, on average, for people who had PFT versus 45 years of age for people who didn't. So that's, you know, no different. But if you look at tenderness to palpation of the ten, uh, tendon sheath, it was 91% in people who had uh, pyogenic flexor tenosynovitis and only 31% in uh, people who didn't. So that was a significant difference. 
And so um, this is a busy slide, but just showing we basically went through all those potential diagnoses and then flagged uh, each of the ones that had uh, potential difference between the two and then put all of those flagged uh, differences into a regression equation to try to take out all the white noise to uh, remove all of the confounders and come up with you know, what's, the, what's really independently uh, predictive. In the process, we were able to estimate the sensitivity specificity and positive predictive, predictive value of the cannibal signs. Interestingly, we found that cannibal signs have high sensitivity for the diagnosis, ranging between 91% and 97%, but actually pretty uh, disappointing uh, specificity and um, mediocre positive predictive value, ranging between 62% and uh, 72%, at least on an individual basis. What we found after regression was that the most important predictive factors were tenderness of the flexor tendon sheath, pain with passive extension, and duration of symptoms less than five days prior to presentation. Each of these three factors were independent predictors in our sample, so uh, having more of these factors was, uh, meant that there was a um, considerably greater um, probability of the person having the condition. And uh, interestingly, despite their sensitivity, fusiform swelling, like that diffuse swelling of the finger, and that sitting in a semi-flex uh, posture, were not independent predictors of whether the diagnosis was present. Duration less than five days was, which was kind of interesting to us, because that had not been uh, evaluated uh, uh, previously, so it's kind of worthy of a future study. We mapped out the various combinations that could potentially happen with all those uh, uh, three uh, independent predictors and found that the weight of each was pretty much equal, enough, enough that is an approximation that we could consider them to be uh, interchangeable. And so we were able to create something similar to the Coker criteria, where the number of um, predictors could tell us the estimated probability of, that con of the diagnosis being present. So if, there's three predict if three of those predictors are present, at least in our sample, the probability was 87.9%. If there was two, it was 30 percent, and if there was only uh, one or, or none, then the chances were essentially uh, zero. The area under the ROC curve plot for that, uh, as a you know estimation of how good the evaluation was, was 0 0.91, making a, an, an excellent test, at least in our sample that it was uh, created from. So, uh, keen observation over 100 years ago stands the test of time and are confirmed to be an accurate description of flexor tenus synovitis. However, we also better understand the limitations. All the cannibal signs are not equal, and the, uh, although they are sensitive, they're not necessarily specific. So what we need to do is to apply what we learned from this sample to a new sample in a prospective study to test whether our proposed prediction tool actually holds up. And possibly equally as important, we need to keenly observe for additional clues for the diagnosis and the severity, just like Alan Cannibal did, and continue to seek out simple diagnostic aids that can help answer the question of whether someone has flexor tenus synovitis, both here and also in our broader health system. Thank you. Good morning. How do you like me now for audio in the back row? All right, Dr. Warm says good. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this nice invitation. I love getting to work with you, and this is an area that I think is fascinating for me, uh, and it's my pleasure to talk with you today and to learn from you. I've learned so much already. Um, yeah, I have many conflicting interests, climbing tall mountains and balancing family life with academic life, etc. but no financial conflicts of interest. My objectives today are to review the microbiology of PFT as I understand them. I'll give you some suggestions for how to get out of tough spots with respect to diagnostic microbiology when you're managing these cases. And then some humble perspectives on antibiotics, how we think about them, how we use them, and some tools of the trade that may be of assistance to you. If there's time, because we have some trainees here, I also want to emphasize the importance of collaboration between ID and orthopedics. Uh, to prepare for this talk, I reviewed our published literature in this area. Frustrating that there's not more, in fact, sort of stunning that over a century of knowledge has been compressed down, at least going back to 1969 when we start with 
PubMed to about 43 hits and nothing before the 1970s that I could get my hands on. There is more that's written down. I didn't go to the original literature. I should have done that. I looked in the Cochrane collaboration. There's nothing on this topic. Um, of course, I reviewed what's in the textbook, so to speak. I also queried the de-identified clinical data repository. For those who aren't familiar with DCDR, this is a microcosm of amalga. It's basically a way to query all of ORCA looking for this particular diagnosis. There was not a single hit for pyogenic flexor tenosynovitis. I would suggest to you that you do see these cases, and yet uh, they're not coded by our coding team as PFT. There are about 20 different flavors of tenosynovitis from Dequer veins on up. But the point is I did not have time to look at every single case we've had for the last 30 years. That data exists. It's accessible to you. If you're interested in this, come talk with me. I'm happy to get this database into your hands. And I've been doing this for 12 years. So maybe that counts for something. So microbiology. Trauma, trauma, trauma. It's all about trauma. So when I think about traumatic injury to this part of the body, I think about Staph aureus. Regardless of the mechanism of injury, whether it's a whale bite or someone who got jabbed with a gardening fork or pricked themselves picking roses, Staph aureus, both methicillin susceptible and methicillin resistant, remain super duper important to think about in all cases. If in doubt, please cover all patients for Staph aureus. That's your apex predator and the carnivore that we worry about most in all of these cases. Having said so, the history is super important, right? So there is a whole variety of things that people do with their hands. That's why it's a whole surgical discipline. I love that because, holy cow, we live in the Northwest. It may only be 5% of the population, but it's the most fun 5%, right? We do all kinds of things recreationally. Water in particular is one that we think about, but in ID, it's not enough to say there was a water exposure. I want to know what kind of water, what they did, and what actually penetrated their hand. If it was the the spine of an Irish lordfish that may be different from someone who was just cleaning the coral off of their uh, reef tank that they have in their basement, etc. So a whole family of different germs, each of which, frustratingly, may require different antimicrobial therapy. Now, the surgical management is the same, but the antibiotics may indeed be different. So that history can be super important. If the patient was exposed not to water but to the earth, Boy, dirt, it's mostly bacteria, or so it seems. And so there's a whole variety of different bacteria and other organisms that are not bacteria, including mold and mold-like bacteria that can certainly get into that tissue space. So we want to understand what someone may have been exposed to at the time of injury. We have people who work in public sanitation, in sewage work, anything that comes out of the rectum of the patient as they flush the toilet, that can get into the tendon space. And so that requires a different spectrum of coverage with respect to antibiotics. And then, of course, there's mouth versus finger. And it turns out that mouths harbor different microorganisms as well. Cat bites and dog bites are what you'll see most frequently, I would assume, maybe followed by or similar to human bites. And I would include a clenched fist injury in that area. I know that knuckle versus incisor sounds like a dorsal process, but as we heard from the first Dr. Kennedy, these spaces do talk to one another. And something that starts on a dorsal knuckle can indeed then involve the flexor spaces. It turns out that if you're bitten by a seal, and we have these cases, you're going to be treated with tetracycline or doxy. If you're bitten by a cat, it will be a mox clav. So those details do indeed matter. Yes, uh, there are other routes of infection with respect to this space, and in theory, hematogenous spread can do it. I have not seen that personally. We have a whole lot of patients in my hospital here with endocarditis, precious few who end up with infection of that space. When that does happen, in my experience, it's almost certainly going to be staph aureus although a streptococcal or other infection could do it, it's probably going to be staph. And indeed, even the hand surgeon needs to think about sex and get a good sexual history. In theory, and there are case reports of disseminated gonococcal infection spreading from the mouth, the rectum, or the general area into these tendon sheets. It can happen. More importantly, however, than hematogenous spread, we like to think about those patient factors. What's wrong with that host? What's happening with the immune system of this patient? If the patient has a so-called normal immune system and a talented surgeon, everything should work out fine, right? We should not have exotic organisms. We should not have trouble healing that surgical site. We shouldn't have trouble clearing the infection. On the other hand, so it seems so many of our patients today, boy, to get admitted to my hospital, you have to be sick at baseline. So all those past medical history issues, not just steroids, but all the other issues that we see in our hospital, patients with stem cell transplants, chemotherapy, Anything that ends in MAB, that really makes me nervous, MAB, right? Any monoclonal antibody that fights the immune system can make it much more difficult for surgeon and ID doctor to battle these infections. And all of those so-called zebras that you'll read about, one-off case reports in the literature, these are those patients where you're more likely to encounter them. Diagnostically, that can be important. So my summary with respect to microbiology, yeah, 
The world's covered in germs. Virtually any one of them can get into this particular anatomic space. It just depends on the mechanism of injury. ID is really easy, my profession. You just need to know everything about everyone all the time. So we groove on those details. We thank you for your initial history and assessment. We may ask more strange and exotic questions of you. If my fellows ask you those funny questions on the phone, please don't roll your eyes, or you can, but we're gonna go to the bedside and try to flesh out that history a bit more. It can be helpful to you diagnostically. We always cover Staph aureus, both flavors of it, and indeed we may need to do more than that depending on what we see diagnostically. So how do we make a diagnosis? It's all about the lab, right? We've heard about the brilliance of Dr. Canavel and what he's done clinically. And I think that this is not just learning. Uh, I think that folks at Mass General, I hope Dr. Jupiter and company have read your papers because that's brilliant. You're actually looking in detail at what we think we know, which I think is terrific. In the lab, it's a little bit different. It's all about sending specific testing. So should you send blood cultures on these patients? Yes, please do. They will very rarely be meaningfully positive. That's why we always ask for two, so that if we get coagulase negative staph in one but not out of two, we'll be able to say it was simply a contaminant, not biologically important. On the other hand, once in a while, the patient will have a staphylococcal bloodstream infection, could be streptococcal infection. That can be helpful, but the negative predictive value here is very, very poor, unfortunately. There are cases in which we will say, ooh, I think this patient has a case of cryptococcal infection, et cetera. There may be exotic blood tests that we suggest, but not often. And they will rarely be helpful, and they'll never be helpful to you at the bedside when you're making that initial assessment. In general, serologies come back by the time the patient is dead or cured and discharged. So it doesn't help you in that sense. Other nonspecific findings, as we've heard about already from our expert discussants, inflammation, it happens, but it doesn't tell us specifically what's going on, unfortunately. It's all about the bug. It's all about growing that germ out of the tissue and then pummeling it with phenotypic testing in our microbiology lab. Tissue is the issue. The lab should always receive specimens of fluid and or tissue, okay? And I think that's important, some, some pearls. Number one, if the sheath is incised and there's really not a lot of synovial fluid or other fluid to send, you're going to irrigate this area anyway. And my humble request would be that that initial irrigation, maybe with angiocaph, just the first 10, 20, 50 cc's, try to dump that into a sterile plastic cup, put a cap on it and send it, and label it as lavage fluid from tendon sheath. We will spin that down with a centrifuge, do a gram stain on the pellet of whatever is there. It'll be mostly white cells but we may be lucky to find organisms, including organisms phagocytosed by neutrophils, et cetera. That can be helpful. Perfectly fine to send the lavage fluid, not three liters, please, but a few cc's, perfectly fine. Number two, so helpful for our laboratory and for the ID fellows, please do take a moment to label those specimens appropriately. It's not emphasized, I think, during GME induction for surgical residents, but in our clinical lab, wounds are second-class citizens. So a wound specimen is treated with a gram stain and not much more. Tissue specimen, very, very different. So there's a huge difference between saying this is a wound. It's a wound, all right. You just made a wound and swabbed it. No, this is a tissue specimen. So something that's called tendon sheath uh, or uh, vincula bone uh, or interosseous muscle, that is handled with great care, precision, and those specimens are held and worked up in an aggressive way. Please always do that. Swabs should always be avoided. Just a word on swabs. I'm on a there's no soapbox here, but if there were, I'd stand on it. So swabs, they're super convenient. They're in every operating room in our hospital. I've tried to go in and pull them out, but on the last minute I thought uh, once in a while it will be helpful to you, but they just don't give us the information that you want for your patient. Unclear how much burden of organism we're talking about. Uh, it's hard to even say whether this was from the surface of the skin or was it from down deep. We can never run PCR on these specimens because that goo that's in the bottom of the tube, that's sterilized seaweed. It's not got bacteria, but it has inhibitors for PCR. So I can maybe see the bug. If it doesn't grow, I can't tell you what it was because I can't run PCR on it. And it's also not as good as just sending the actual tissue. Swabs, a big bowl bad, and in general to be avoided. I know that sometimes it's all you can reach for, but if you can, send meat or fluid that's better uh, for your patients and for you. All specimens should always be sent for a gram stain. That should always be done stat so that as you're finishing your case, you can get a sense for whether we're gram positive, gram negative, or gram stain negative. There's gram negative organisms and there's a negative gram stain. Those are different. You need to know that. They should always be sent for bacterial culture. And it's true that if we treat these patients with aggressive antibiotics, we may reduce the yield of those cultures, and that's perfectly fine. I'd rather have a patient who keeps their digit and we never really know what they had. Furthermore, unfortunately, if my drugs were good enough to get into your tendon space, we wouldn't have to do surgery in the first place. So it's what we're really trying to do with antibiotics is prevent sepsis and try to salvage uh, the amount of, well, 
to treat those areas that are surrounding that tissue to prevent local extension of that infection. Always treat first, just like in any case of sepsis, and we'll worry about microbiology second. And then second of all, yep, there's other testing we may do. So AFB testing, or acid fast bacilli can be done. We can look for fungi as well. Put the fun in fungus, that's what we do in infectious diseases. But that's something that in general I would not propose that you send on your own without talking with us first. Because generally speaking, these testing modalities will not be required. Call us like a voter in Chicago early and often. We'll be happy to work with you even as you're in the case. I may not be able to dispatch my fellow to your OR, although we always try get in the bunny suit and see what's going on. But at least by phone we can get, based on the history, a sense of what other testing may be required. What about PCR? Molecular testing is great, right? It's on CSI, it's on TV. Why don't we test everybody by PCR? Uh, the key with this test is that um, it's expensive. And unfortunately, the information that comes out may not be as helpful to you as you might think. Now, all tissue specimens are meant to be held for 21 days. In my own personal experience working in the lab for a long time, I've never seen them chuck anything before a week, and they usually are pretty good about a three-week hold for all specimens. And that means that if our initial workup is negative, we can always, yes, add on PCR post hoc. That's perfectly fine. We will take care of that for you. It's a bit of an issue to add on that molecular testing. We're happy as your consultants to take care of that. We will go to the laboratory and make sure that it is right and proper. You should understand that people send their specimens to us from around the world, and certainly nationally. So UW Micro, uh, molecular testing is the best there is. You're not getting second class. It doesn't have to go to Mayo Clinic, etc. They often send stuff to us as well. So the quality of the information that you get is as good as it can possibly be. But unfortunately, if you amplify some environmental bug uh, or coagulase negative staph, you may not know for sure that that's what was in there deeply in the tissue itself. And furthermore, we don't always amplify something up because the organism burden may have been low to start with. Uh, and it costs about a thousand bucks, so we try to hold off on that unless absolutely necessary. In summary, regarding microbiology, tissue is the issue. We want to label them accurately and we want to avoid swabs. There may be other testing that we will propose. It's the early results that can guide your early therapy, and certainly with phenotypic testing, we can focus and narrow that coverage, hopefully to PO and hopefully off your service and home. Very important to think about this. Speaking of which, how do we handle antibiotics? So I, I just wanted to get this out on the table initially, right? So the corners, this is a surgical disease. The cornerstone of management has always been, since the brilliance of Dr. Cannavale, surgery, right? We've known this since 1930s and before. But there still are questions, although I think that's still true today. What is the best technique? We've heard from the first Dr. Kennedy. We have open techniques and we have angiocatheter-directed techniques. And I think, as you've heard, it's possible to choose one or the other. I'm not clear that I understand the answer. I love the idea of an open lavage and debridement because we know what we're dealing with. When the finger is closed, I think there's more uncertainty, put it that way. That's my non-surgeon's opinion. What do we use to irrigate, by the way? Right, so I love no normal saline. Uh, the OR tech should hand you normal saline that is non-bacteriostatic. There are ingredients in saline that keep it better on the shelf for long periods of time, but of course that's gonna reduce your yield for culture. So if possible, please make sure that the nurse or scrub tech is handing you non-bacteriostatic normal saline. Whether you add antibiotics into that saline is entirely up to you. Most of my colleagues think this is a terrible idea. There's no evidence for it. And after all, we're going to get the patients, that's why we have veins, right, to hook up to IV antibiotics. So why bother putting antibiotics into the lavage? My sense is that once those initial specimens are sent, uh, so that initial washing should be with truly just saline to get that to the lab. And after that, it doesn't matter to me so much. I'm much more fast and loose with lavage antibiotics. I know that it makes, sometimes makes the surgeons feel better, and it may make a difference for rapid killing power. The point is it probably does not matter. Saline itself is probably perfectly fine, and if you choose to add something on top of that, it should just be something that's relatively non-toxic. Vancomycin is one of those. Cephazolin is another one of those. Perfectly okay to use. Um, should we use this as adjunctive therapy, or should it be total therapy? So I'll just put it up there. It sounds like heresy, right? Should we treat with just antibiotics alone and not operate on these patients? There are case reports of success. I've read them as part of my literature review. You could well imagine that that would happen. I would put it to you that there might very well be some diagnostic uncertainty. There are hand infections and there are hand infections. And some patients who get better with antibiotics may not indeed have had PFT. I guess I don't really fully know whether it's PFT until I open up that patient. If we're talking about an 87 point something percent positive predictive value of the combined scoring that you've talked about. Yeah, the number needed to cut, I mean, if that's one out of 10 that we're mistaken when we open them up, that's I think better than appendectomies in general surgery. Open these patients up. We know what we're dealing with. 
I would just say I think it's challenging to study otherwise. If we're going to talk about this, there should be some diagnostic uncertainty. The patient should have a normal immune system. We should have a sense that there's no foreign body, no obvious penetration. They should present early. They shouldn't be super sick. They should get better quickly, and there should be a willingness to take them to the OR if that doesn't work. I have not been in this predicament or this situation, and perhaps if there's time at the end of our discussion, we can talk about that. You may have other experiences. Generally speaking, surgery and then antibiotics in that order. What happens if there's no, nothing on the gram stain? You're in the operating room. The gram stain sent stat, and there are no organisms seen. Maybe some polys, but no bugs. So I think this patient should be treated with intravenous antibiotics. Doesn't mean they need IV the whole time, but up front, we always start with IV. Because we can, and because we know that the spectrum and the potency will be fine, there's no question about what they can absorb. Are they still NPO, post-op, et cetera? So IV therapy, and my proposal would be intravenous vancomycin plus intravenous ceftriaxone. We're covering staph, we're covering staph again, and we're covering enterobacteriaceae. What we're not covering is pseudomonas, and so if there is a strong waterborne history here, those patients should receive ceftazidine instead of ceftriaxone. Both are third generation cephalosporins. Ceftriaxone, great for gr most gram positives, including uh, MSSA, not so much for pseudomonas. Pseudomonas, ceftazidine. What we give up with ceftazidine is the gram positive coverage we get with ceftriaxone. So even early on, it's important to think about mechanism. If it's a cat bite, it wouldn't be either of these things it would be so-called unison or amp solbactam. So the history features into this already. Yes, I am very eager to step these patients down to PO as soon as possible. Generally speaking, when that patient is improving, we can almost always consolidate with PO therapy. The difference would be that if the bone is heavily involved, there might be an urge by some of our specialists in my field to go with IV longer for treatment of osteomyelitis. Actually, a lot of osteomyelitis can be treated PO as well. It depends on the bug and it depends on how deep and advanced that infection may be. And, and this issue of whether patients, even with long bone osteomyelitis, different syndrome, could be treated with PO right up front, that's an orthopedic study that's now enrolling and ongoing at Harborview Medical Center. It's run by the Department of Orthopedics. If you're a resident on ortho doing trauma service at Harborview, you'll become very clear about this study. We're happy to collaborate with you on it. It's about time that we really settled this issue about IV versus PO in long bone osteo. In this particular case, we would always start with IV antibiotics and then step down when possible. Now, if there's a negative gram stain again, or if there are gram positive cocci, GPCs in clusters, that's vancomycin for sure, because that covers both MSSA and MRSA. My pearl is that one dose of vanco does not fit all. There's sort of a uh, practice among house officers to give a gram Q12 when it comes to vancomycin. That is probably insufficient in many cases to get us where we need to be with vanco. We want to load these patients, usually two grams if they're over 70 keys or one and a half if they're under 70 keys. We're trying to make it easy for you to use this. And then we want to maintain them. And that should be a weight-based dose. Assuming the patient's young, healthy, has normal kidney function, weight-based dosing is the way to go. And we want to check a vancomycin level before that fourth dose. I strongly, strongly encourage you in all cases of PFT and any question about an orthopedic infection, please consult infectious diseases. We are happy to do this. We know that you hate to do this. That's part of our job. Let us take that burden for you. No sweat. So if the patient's being opened up and the gram stain shows gram positive cocci, then we've given this patient vancomycin. But remember, it is phenotypic testing that tells us where we want to be. So this is so-called Kirby-Bauer diffusion disc testing. It was invented in this hospital. We're very proud of it. We still do it routinely for all of our isolates. And in this particular case, happy days, Sofoxidin, a big zone of inhibition. Oxacillin, a big zone. Ceftriaxone, big zone. This is methicillin-sensitive Staph aureus. You'll see this frequently in your case, and you'll feel pretty good about it. They're on Vanco, and they have Staph, but not so much. When it comes to Staph aureus, there are two flavors. Methicillin-resistant Staph aureus should be treated, yes, with vancomycin. But if it's MSSA, we will always treat those patients whenever possible with a beta-lactam. Beta-lactam is the drug of choice against MSSA and not vancomycin. Vancomycin does cover them, but cefazolin is a better killer. So although vanco has the spectrum, cefazolin has the killing power. And that's what we would like to do. If this happens to be a contiguous osteomyelitis, tendon sheath related to someone who's had a reconstruction, there's a plate in the finger bone or something like this, yes, we will try to add rifampin too because that penetrates non-viable uh, hardware when it's implanted. That should rarely be an issue with respect to PFT. On the other hand, if we do this and we see this microorganism, this is a gram stain from a knee, actually, that a patient I took care of with Paul Manor. But this is strep, right? So it's a different issue. And I can hold this up to the light and see that soft romantic candlelight beta hemolysis. This is going to be group B strep. And that patient should receive intravenous penicillin. 
or for ease of dosing, perhaps ceftriaxone, fine, but certainly not the vancomycin. On the other hand, if we do the gram stain and we see this, then projects super well, but these are relatively long, delicate looking gram negative rods. Holy cow, if the culture in particular has that green look, this is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And in fact, this is the kind of pseudo that I love because you can hardly even see it. The zones of inhibition around those discs are huge, a pan-susceptible friendly, cipro-susceptible strain of Pseudomonas. We don't see that so much, right? We often see something that looks more like this, where the growth comes up closer to the disc. Ciprofloxacin, I'm sorry to say, not gonna work out for this patient. This is a multi-drug resistant Pseudomonas and it'll be parenteral therapy. So again, not just the ID, but that phenotypic testing can be so important for stepping down and deciding what to do. And there's other things that can come out too. If it's cryptococcus, we'll give them fluconazole. If it's a case of mycobacterium, it's a big bowl of bad, we have to decide if it's TB or otherwise. So the answer to the question of microbiology and antibiotics is it depends, and we thank you for working with us to get high quality information into the lab so we can get you high quality treatment data out of that. How long do we treat? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> Medical school, you learn what infections are. Residency, you learn how to start antibiotics. ID fellowship, let's refine that regimen, make it more elegant. And then there's faculty life. The rest of your academic life to figure out when to stop. It's the hardest question in my profession. I will tell you that the trend overall in all of ID, not only orthopedic, but elsewise, is in general we're trying to treat with less. We have picked durations, uh, because we like football, we pick football scores, seven, 14, 21. Like we don't know how many days these patients should receive, frankly. The data set is poor. I think the answer is it depends. And what we need to hear from you is how was the operating room? Was debridement satisfactory to you? Was the washout good enough? Was it what you expected to see? How much tissue necrosis was there? And how's that patient's overall post-operative clinical response? We have not done what you have done with respect to the prognostic signs, with respect to understanding the timing of reduction of swelling, erythema, ESR. I could imagine a study looking at this. We have not, to my knowledge, done so. But in general, if patients do well and they respond as we think, we know what we're dealing with, yeah, a week is probably perfectly fine. At the end of a week, the patient's wound will not be healed, they will not be fully comfortable, but the bugs are gone. It's about healing and inflammation. On the other hand, if the patient's bloodstream was positive, we treat them for 14 days. I like to treat them for 14 days after they turn negative, although there's controversy there. Certainly if the bone is involved, then we go for six weeks. If it's tuberculosis, we go even longer. It depends. So if we give you different answers on different consults, please understand that's not uh, because we're fickle, it just sort of depends. And yeah, we're fickle. So in the last few moments, I'll say to our, our house officers, the pearls for collaboration between ID and orthopedics. We're not very smart in ID. We, every patient is seen through the lens of three different uh, perspectives, right? So there's the patient, there's the bug, and the antibiotics, and the physician, orthopedist, or ID doctor lives in the middle. And so the patient, what are those medical comorbidities? What are the risk factors? Are they alcoholic? Are they heavily immunosuppressed? What's it about this person that will make it more challenging or less with respect to coverage? And that may be, where do they live? Do they have someone to take care of them at home, right? Patient factors. What about the bug? And is this a rapacious carnivore? Is this a relatively smoldering bug? Is it something that's resistant to everything we have on the pantry shelf? That's more of an issue on the East Coast, certainly more of an issue internationally. In Seattle, our gram-negative resistance profile looks better than most parts of America, but things are not getting better. They're getting worse over time. And then uh, bug juice. Does it go to the part of the body we want? Is it going to be interacting with other medications? IV versus PO, toxicity, side effects, you name it. So we don't always say this out loud in our notes, but we should. And we do this sort of quietly to ourselves every time. That's how our brain works. I would encourage you to call us again early and often. It's so important for us, whenever possible, to hear from someone who is in the case. We love hearing from the R1, poor person who's on the wards and not in the operating room. That's fine. We may then call the fellow uh, or the attending to say, what really happened, please? Because we need to understand the details of what actually that debridement may have looked like. I think we charge insurance 192 bucks. That's what I'm worth for an ID consult. <laughs> but I always tell the house officers, it is so priceless for us to hear from a surgeon who is in that patient's <laughs> hand. Um, because we un hey, I need to understand whether you're happy about it. Either things went well or they didn't, and that sometimes gets lost in translation from attending to fellow to R1 back to our fellow to my attending. It's a game of telephone. <laughs> so I will usually call you before we do this, and we will always deliver, I hope, a high-quality product. So I don't do surgery, I don't do biopsies, I do consults, and the quality of, that you get should be very, very straightforward. Our notes should be clear, it should be prompt, it should be based on the evidence. We should always talk to the surgeons before we write something down, because otherwise we can put something in the chart that may not be 
jibing with reality. We don't want to put you in a tight spot. This usually comes up with respect to total joint arthroplasties, less so in trauma. Even so, it's important, and we need to be, yeah, in all things, adaptable and flexible. If this does not happen, you need to call me personally. I am in charge of ID fellowship clinical training, and that's my job. Uh, if you're not happy with what you get, let me know. I was so pleased to hear Dr. Wong talk about praise of some of your trainees. If people do a good job for you, I'd like to hear that too. I'd like to do something similar for our ID fellows. So, I mean, if we don't think about things and talk to each other, one landscape, two different agendas, and the possibility for miscommunication may be disastrous results. I'm a hiker, not a hunter. I thank you so much for your time, and I think all three of us may have time to answer questions also related to the lecture. Thank you. I think you know that's one thing that we're interested in looking at. You know, particularly the um, you know the ubiquitous use of uh, 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 cameras. You know, uh, even on even on cell phones, but maybe in a more uh, organized way of telemedicine. And so, I think to start off with, we should take a ton of photos of flexor tenosynovitis and some pictures that are not tenosynovitis, and then have you know uh, people evaluate them and see what they see what they are just based on you know, what, what they look like, and that would probably go a long way and, be easy, and probably get access to places in, in, you know, that are uh, uh, in a wider geographic area. Should there be fluid seen along the extent of the tendon if you had all the sound? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean it, would, it would probably, we, we heard that it's, um, that it's, it's expanded, there's pressure inside there, so it would be, an, you know, it would be increased in size. It would be painful for the patient, um, and you would be, you know, ultrasound is, tends to be very um, operator dependent. So, you know, it may not solve the problem when we're, you know, looking at places where they, you know, it depends on how comfortable that emergency physician is going to be putting an ultrasound probe and what kind of ultrasound probe they have. They may only have one that's, you know, good for getting IV access or something, and so they may not get detailed evaluation. But if there's a, you know, radiologist there, then it might uh, be able to do that. I think that would be some, definitely something worth looking into as we do more of this. Dr. Potter, just from a practical point, I take this piece of tissue, I put it in this cup, and it sits in this cup, and by the time it gets to the lab, it's kind of like a small potato chip crumb. How do, how do I get that? I mean, when is a, a small potato chip crumb, is it still going to grow a bacteria? Yeah, thank you. So the question relates to the viability of a specimen, especially if it's a small scrap of tissue. And after all, you're not going to carry a whole limb down, I hope. So, with, so inoculum is everything. The more tissue we get, the more bugs that are on it. Um, the viability of the bacteria, however, if it goes into a dry, empty cup, and that is what I suggest, and not with saline in it, yeah, perfectly fine. At this hospital and at Harborview, the turnaround time will be perfectly fine. The germs, unfortunately, are absolutely happy to survive in that kind of an environment. There are some germs that are hyper-exquisitely susceptible to atmospheric oxygen, the so-called anaerobes, uh, including some cases of fusobacterium and others. They're rare. Uh, we do sometimes see them in this injury, especially against human mouth versus finger. But even in that case, we should be able to grow it. And it, if we have the tissue, we can extract and run PCR on it later. The good news about those cases is they're usually very amenable to antibiotics and washout. Those patients should get better. So it's perfectly okay, yes, to send it down in a dry cup. Good question. Yeah, a, fo a follow-up to that. At yeah, Children's, uh, I was putting chunks of bacteria, uh, chunks of tissue into the swabs and sending them, thinking that they could work with them. And they called me and said, we can't cut these open and get your chunk out. You need to send them in a cup. So yeah. um, changed our practice there. Thank you uh, for sharing that. Uh, one other comment. Um, I love that you distinguish between sensitivity and positive predictive values of tests. We, we, we have this issue you know, with the hip, with the Coker criteria. That, oh, we've got all four Coker criteria. We must have a septic hip. Well, 
you can have a necrotizing fasciitis, uh, the groin, and it'll look in the same way. So you still have to think about what the possible breadth of the differential is and not just describe it to the, the one diagnosis. Right. So thank you. Thank you. One of the questions from Harborview was, um, can you ask Dr. Pottinger about double coverage for staff? So I uh, PO Bactrim plus Keflex for non-surgical or post-op patients, not necessarily FTS, with MRSA risk factors. Does this ever make sense? And uh, you know, do you have any recommendations or not about the use of PO Bactrim and Keflex at the same time? Sure, yeah, thanks. So the question relates to not just PFT. So when it comes, it's sort of along the lines of what I was mentioning before. It's the sulfa in that scenario is analogous to the vancomycin we would use intravenously. They're designed to kill MRSA. Trimethrum sulfamethoxazole or Bactrim susceptibility for the MRSA at both Harborview and UW is approximately 85%. It doesn't always work, but it often does, and it's a great empiric option that's free in PO. So we love that, and yet at the same time, not as impactful against MSSA. So if, like I mentioned before, sort of like IV cefazolin, what we would typically use if we knew that we had a patient with MSSA infection and they needed IV therapy, we would always step them down to a PO ceph, such as cephalexin or keflex. So if you have some diagnostic uncertainty, pyogenic uh, infection, it's incised and drained. Look, in most cases of soft tissue infection, incision and drainage is enough and there's no PO mop-up required whatsoever. But let's say it's a, an appreciable surrounding cellulitis or the patient's an abnormal host, you do want to mop up with something PO, then we try to cover for both. It's typically either sulfa plus uh, cephalexin or doxycycline plus cephalexin. Some patients come to your practice, they say they are sulfa allergic, and some of them are right, usually not, but you don't know that. <laughs> so you're stuck as the orthopedist saying, I want to cover for both MSSA and strep as well as MRSA. I'm going to give them both cephalexin and sulfa. Frankly, it's more about the strep. That's where this idea of double coverage comes from. Streptococcal species not well covered by Bactrim. And so that's where that idea of two, two coverages comes from. If it's pyogenic, it's almost always staph. If it's a cellulitis, it's almost always strep. So it's usually easy to tell, but I get it. Sometimes it can be difficult to say. It's a good question. Okay. This has been a very content-rich hour. Thank you for that. And I'm sensitive to the point that there are a lot of people in the Miami area that are faced with these cases and don't have a clue as to how to proceed. So one of the thoughts that you might consider is putting up something on the, the web Thank you very much. Thanks, folks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.